first time to be to Johnson City, Tennessee, and we had plans, Joel, my brother, my youngest brother, we had plans to be here for a pastoral, I think installation, if I recall. Uh, we were coming here kind of like on the way to General Conference that year, and and that that's General Conference got canceled. Well, not really canceled, but the in-person General Conference got canceled, and it went to an online kind of a virtual deal, and so everything went on hold, and, and that's been a few years ago. So here we are, finally, made it to Johnson City. But, uh, I know a couple of you, but most of you are, are new to us, and uh, look forward to getting to meet you. And as you said, we've, we're starting late. I apologize. We've had compatibility issues, and... Uh, but we're here. Here we go. Yes. We're, we've got, we're ready to roll. So I'm going to launch into it. I think we've got a couple lessons. I want to redeem the time. You've got handouts, but it does really help. If you can see the screen, let me tilt it maybe so that you guys can see it all the way. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. All right. And you can still see it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll launch into this. Uh, I'll just start by saying, um, so I've been pastoring, senior pastor. It'll be 40 years mm -hmm. next mm -hmm. July. Mm -hmm. uh, the same church, South Bay Pentecostal Church. Um, I actually changed the name of the church. It was actually First United Pentecostal Church of National City. When I became pastor, we maxed out our property and knew we had to move. We didn't want to leave National City, but there were no options. It's wherever we can find space, that's where we've got to go. And so in that process, we decided, you know, in case we don't stay in National City, why don't we change our name now, let it get out there, and then wherever we land, so we call ourselves South Bay because everything south of the Coronado Bridge across the San Diego Bay is called South Bay. There's several cities, towns, including San Diego, wraps on around there. We ended up landing in Chula Vista, only about three miles probably from our previous location, maybe less than three miles, two to three miles. Um, and uh, so I, I made that move two years into my new pastor. I'd been with the church, though, assisting my father, who was the pastor prior, for six years. And uh, so, all together in a pastoral kind of a role, I guess, you know, more than, more than 40 years. But um, when I became pastor, we evangelized before pastoring. There's another story how that even came about. But, but when I became pastor, I went on a personal quest to try to discover everything I could about, you know, growing a church. And, and so I did that. For three years, I went to every seminar. Now, we didn't really have anything within UPCI at that time directly for church growth. Our, what we now call North American Missions, used to be called Home Missions, and they focused totally on brand new church starts, and they focused totally on, you know, teaching Bible studies. They had nothing at that particular time for existing churches. So, we really had to look outside the UPCI for any help in that, in that area. So, I did, and, and God blessed me to be pastoring full-time and have the ability to manage my own schedule where I could, you know, travel to these different meetings and what have you. So I did. For three years, every meeting I heard of, I went to it. Uh, if, it's, if they authored the book, I, I met them personally. If they pastored, I wanted to go to their church. I had lunch with them. Uh, so you name the person, the author, from the John Maxwells to the, uh, uh, oh, mine's going blank. And we all, all the names about church growth through the, through the 90s, in particular 80s. 80s and 90s, became pastor in 1984. Um, and three years into that, God just sort of like arrested me. And I, in fact, I was in a, uh, I was in a conference. This conference cost $2,000. I took my assistant pastor with me, and he and I were in this conference. Where most of these conferences, I was the only Pentecostal of any stripe in the conference, much <laughs> less a United Pentecostal, uh, a oneness Pentecostal. But I remember we were in this conference, large pastor's conference, we're the only Pentecostals in the room. And um, in the middle of all of that, God said, what are you doing? I did not call you to grow a church. And, and it just sort of like cold water in my face. Like, what? Well, have I wasted three years and time and money and effort? And, and, uh, and the Lord said, no, I haven't called you to grow a church. I called you to grow people. Mm, that's good. And if you'll grow people... They'll grow a church. It shifted my entire paradigm, my, the whole dynamic of what I was trying to do. Here was my philosophy. I don't think it's a wrong philosophy, but my philosophy was this. Number one, there's no doubt in my mind, then or now, 
that we have the right doctrine. Amen. Oh, yes. And we have the right experience. Uh, Acts 2.38 is my favorite verse in the Bible. In fact, that's my Starbucks name is Acts 2.38. It literally is. And so we were in the airport yesterday, and, and I love it to be in a busy airport. And they say, Acts 2.38, your order's ready. I got Starbucks <laughs> preaching the gospel. I love it. That wicked, ungodly company. <laughs> trying to turn their evil to good. I love it. And, uh, so, so there's no doubt in my mind, we've got the right doctrine, we've got the right experience. So it bugged me, like, why then are we not the largest church in town, or at least the growing, the fastest growing church in town? Why aren't we? And uh, so I thought, you know, they're doing something that works. They don't have the right doctrine, they don't have the right experience, but they found something that works. Maybe it's just business skills, I don't know, people skills, who knows what. But you know, if, if I could find their secrets, and as long as it doesn't violate my faith, apply their practical stuff to my doctrine of Bible experience, spiritual experience, then we ought to be the fastest growing church in town. So that was my whole thought process, and I still don't think that's wrong. But in the process of doing that is when God said, right in the middle of this conference, and God says, I didn't call you to grow a church. I called you to grow people. And if you'll grow people, they'll grow a church. It changed my whole dynamic. So that's what put me then on a quest of what we're doing here, leadership, growing people. My greatest joy as a pastor is not having a record attendance, and I love to have a record attendance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's not the normal kind of stuff, right? It's when an individual, one person, comes to me and says, Pastor, you'll never believe what happened this week at my job. Mm. I got a promotion. I got a position I'm the least qualified for. Yeah. I know it. I, I, I don't have the experience. I don't no. have the training. I don't have the whatever. Right. And they chose me over everybody else. And I know why. Mm -hmm. It's because of what I learned at this church being a leader. It has grown me as a person. And it affects every arena of your life. That, to me, is my greatest personal satisfaction and joy to touch one life and change one individual. And if we'll keep that, and I think that's what Jesus did. Yes. And if we keep that focus, you know, the growth, the most, it'll take care of itself. Yeah. Healthy relationships produce children. You don't have to send young people through a class at school to learn how to make kids. Come on. It's right. just going to happen. Yeah. Right. If you've got a healthy relationship, it's just going to happen. I think the same is true in the, in the body of Christ, the church family. That if you've got a healthy relationship and you've got growth in life, it, it's just going to happen. Right. This, your growth and multiplication, it's going to be a natural byproduct. So I'm going to share with you in these lessons what I've received. And from that, I then became the church growth coordinator for UPCI. Actually, first time they, they had one. Jack Cunningham uh, uh, began and was in there a few months and went to headquarters, and I, and I became the next. So for 10 years, all through the 90s, I led church growth for UPCI, and we put on conferences. We put on five a year. We did this for years. Uh, we called them Church Growth 2000 Conference. Once we hit the year 2000, we kind of had to think of something new. <laughs> we kind of thought, hey, the Lord's got to come by the <laughs> So we'll just go in the rapture with this. And, right. Well, you didn't come. Yeah. Here we are, you know, 23 years later. But anyway, yeah. uh, yes. but, uh, but those are great conferences. So we would always start in San Diego. That gave us the chance to tweak things. But we took the same conference, same speakers. It was the identical conference we replicated all across the country. We do it in regions. So we did San Diego for the western region. We went from there to Houston for the Kilgore's Church for the South. We went to uh, Florida, Orlando for the Mike Williams Church. And we went to Gaithersburg, Maryland, Ron Libby's Church for the Northeast. And then we went to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, Eau Claire, for their, uh, Tony Tamil's Church uh, for that. We never got the Northwest. We always wanted to add, never got that added. But we did that for, for years. And so uh, some of this is things that I've put together over the years and lessons. I actually teach a course on leadership, and um, uh, it's, it's nine lessons plus review plus test at CSTI, Christian Service Training Institute, which is both satellite campuses and, and indi individual uh, distance learning. It's available, it's endorsed by UPCI. Uh, you get Bible College credits for it, it's a four year scope and sequence. And so these lessons I'm gonna share with you literally are lifted from my course on, on leadership at, at CSTI. And I teach this in some of the other colleges as well, ABI, and, and I've taught uh, adjunct professor so, call so let's start with this lesson number one is called i call it leadership 101 leadership what is it now leadership is exercised in a vast number of ways there are leaders in crime leaders in business mm -hmm. leaders in the military we've got some of these leaders here with us today 
events. Enter. There we go. There are leaders in government. If you can look real hard, you'll find. <laughs> and politics. You have to look a lot harder there. <laughs> there are leaders in civic and community affairs. There are also leaders in the spiritual world, both yes. angelic and demonic yes. leadership. But God also has leadership in his church, which can be very different from the leadership exercise in the rest of the world. So these lessons, though they're entitled leadership, I want you to think of it as Christian leadership, since it is possible the leadership may be spiritual and bad at the same time. But as pointed out, the whole spiritual world and the world of evil influences definitely has its hierarchy of leadership. Christian leadership, by absolute definition, must be leadership by Christ or leadership by one who's Christ's disciple. Therefore, this subject must deal with the principles of leadership, which Jesus both demonstrated and taught. However, it will also deal with some of the psychology of leadership in the natural sense, though sometimes only as comparison. So, let's start with this. What is leadership? The whole title of this lesson is that. What is leadership? Sometimes it's easier to define what something is by, first of all, recognizing what it's not, because oftentimes we instantly jump to something that it really is not. So, let's deal with that. Leadership is not a position. Leadership is not a rank. Leadership is not a title. Leadership, pure and simple, is influence. Influence. That is key. I mean, that is absolutely the cornerstone, the anchor of everything about leadership. Leadership is influence. Now, when you have influence, you may be tapped to fill a position an office and right. a title. Right. Right. But the position office title is not what makes you a leader. Right. What right. makes you a leader is influence. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, a especially new or young or inexperienced leader discovers this the hard way. I remember I had a, a leader in our church who, he was actually the men's ministries leader. And he came to me one day and he said, Pastor, I need you to be at the next meeting we have with the men. I said, okay. He said, I need you to speak. I said, okay, what do you want me to speak on? He said, well, he said, what I need you to do is tell them I am their leader. They've got to follow me. Oh. Well, when he said that, I instantly recognized he doesn't understand leadership. That's the whole problem right there. And everything rises and falls on leadership. So we've got a problem. It's not a men's problem. It's a leader problem. <laughs> he thought that, you know, because he carried the rank, the title, the position, what have you, that that just automatically meant you got to do what I say, and if that doesn't work, go to a higher authority and let him come down with that hand. Well, it doesn't work that way. I had another leader come to me once, and we had a need to fill a leadership position in the church, and he came and he said, Pastor, he said, if you would consider me for that particular position, you would be amazed at what I would, what I would accomplish for the kingdom of God. Huh. And I said, you're one of the most honest men I know. I am sure I would be most amazed at what you would accomplish for the kingdom of God. Again, I recognize he didn't understand leadership because if he already had the qualities and capability to do something amazing for the kingdom of God, why didn't he do it? Why is he waiting until he has That's that title, right. that right. position, yeah. that rank, that office, the name on the door, what have you? So leadership is not those things. Mm -hmm. Leadership is influence. Let me give you one more illustration. I had a leader come in one time, and they said, in fact, this, this is a very faithful leader, very honorable person. And they literally had their keys in their hand. They came in my office. They put them on my desk. They said, I'm through. I'm finished. <laughs> I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what's going on? What's, what's happening here? And, uh, and, and they said, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so has more influence in this, the group that they were, they were leading, has more influence than I do. And, and I'm done with it. Uh, I said, no, 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 no. I said, listen, here, here's how you need to approach this. And I gave them a little lesson. Leadership is, is influence. If you wake up and discover someone else in the group has influence you don't have, that's okay. It's good that you recognize it. Yeah. Your job now becomes influence the influencer. Influence the influencers. Don't that's worry right. about those people that they're influencing. Right. You influence them. Yeah. And once you now are influencing them, you once again have the leadership, the influence over the whole group. So it's key that we understand what leadership is not. And then we understand what it is. Leadership is influence. And influence is not given to you. Influence yes. is earned. It's earned. And it's earned through relationship. 
and it's earned through your own example of humility, being a servant, being a hard worker, not being about me, but being about, being about God, the kingdom. And people know that. They pick up on that. They sense that. People are going to resist someone who's all about them. But they're going to gravitate to someone. I'm talking about in the kingdom of God. Now, that works different in the world. There's some things that work different in the world. In the world, uh, you know, in certain spheres to be successful, it's got to be about you. All right? You've got to be king and make sure everybody knows you're king and proclaim yourself king. And I'm king of the world. I'm the best whatever there is, you know. But not in the kingdom of God. Jesus told us that, didn't he? He yeah. said, if you want to be chief in my kingdom, you do that by being the lowest position. That's right. That's right. By being a servant. Of everybody. You, you put yourself, he says, when you come in a room, don't sit at the head of the table. You sit at the foot of the table. If they move you up, well, that's with honor. But if you just assume that and they move you down, well, now you've got dishonor. <laughs> so this is one area where the kingdom of God is totally different from the kingdom of man. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes we can learn things, like I'm going to these other churches and leaders at the time to learn some things. The Bible says that the children of this world are in their own generation in certain instances. They're wiser than the children of life. So we can certainly learn things, but we also know that there are differences. And this is one of those differences. Servanthood leadership is what the Lord Jesus has called us to. All right. James G. Uh, James C. Georges, and he's the head of Par Training Corporation, the CEO, he said this. What is leadership? Remove for a moment the moral issues behind it, and there's only one definition. Leadership is the ability to obtain followers. Mm. Again, leadership is influence. Leadership is the ability to obtain followers. An old Chinese proverb says, he who thinks he is leading but has no one following is only taking a walk. <laughs> so every now and then, pause and look behind you yeah. and, and see who's following you. That's good. You can measure That's your good. leadership. You can measure your influence. Now, let's talk about two styles of leadership. One is positional leadership. The other is the influential leader. So let's talk about that. The, the position leader drives his followers. The influence leader leads his followers. The position leader depends upon authority. But the influence leader depends upon goodwill. Doesn't the scripture say not being lords over God's heritage? We call this benevolent, taking the benevolent oversight. Are we given oversight? Certainly we are. Certain roles has to be good stewards of God and take oversight. But we've got to realize we're doing that on the goodwill of the people. We can't demand, make, or force. That's not how the kingdom of God operates. The position leader induces fear. If you don't do this, something bad is going to happen to you. But the influence leader inspires enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. The position leader says, I. The influence leader says, we. The position-oriented leader fixes the blame for problems. The influence leader fixes the problem. I'll never forget, every year, for many, many years, our church has done what we call church camp out. Um, and it's not like camp meeting, it's like camping out. And we rent a facility. Uh, we go to various places at different times. One, and my wife and I, we started in tents, like personal sized tent. We graduated to military sized tent. <laughs> we get guys in the military. We had this big tent, <laughs> giant tent, command center. That's when we got kids. And uh, and then we graduated to again. Thank God for the military guys helping us out. We graduated to the military trailer, and then we graduated to the military motorhome, which was small. It was a motorhome. And then we ended up buying our own motor home at, a, at an estate auction, the tax sale auction. <laughs> and, uh, and, and now we got a big motor home that now is too big for us. We need to get rid of it. We need to sell it and, and <laughs> go back to the small stuff we get. Yeah. But, uh, so we've done all these phases, all right? And, and in our church camp out, you'll see all these phases. There we, in fact, we probably have some people don't even have a tent. They're just sleeping out there in a sleeping bag or whatever, all the way up to, to, to bringing a cabin or whatever. So this one particular year, we were at this camp that had like camp in the circle. So everybody's in a circle, whether you're a tent, an RV or whatever, it's like a giant circle, kind of like the old pioneer days that we could envision, you know, where they're traveling across the country. And it was cool. So they you know, fires in the middle and the center of attention, and tables and people come together. Late at night, we have a little fireside service and then afterwards there's gonna be some fellowship. 
And uh, we had just bought our kids at the time a little puppy dog. Well, I say little. It was a puppy dog. It wasn't that little. It was a basset hound. They're very low to the ground. You know, it's the one that's on the hush puppy shoebox, floppy ears, and uh, cute, cutest little dog. But uh, so during service time, we just had a, I think a chain or a cord or something, and we tied it outside our little area here, our personal camping space was like the water spigot, but it was stake. It was stake went down on the ground. And so we just would tie it to that stake, this little puppy, so he couldn't come, you know, into the circle and, and all the people. Well, as soon as the service ended, Kids start running everywhere. Well, when kids would run through our little space, the little puppy dog would, he would run after him. So he'd run and he would hit the end of the rope and they'd just jerk him right off his feet, you know. <laughs> and he would wait there, pace. When they'd come, he'd run the other way to jerk him off his feet. Well, one of these times, he ran and, and, and it didn't jerk him off the feet. He, he busted that pipe out. Come to find out, that pipe was just a plastic PVC pipe <laughs> and it was staked. But somehow, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a metal stick, apparently. It must have been wood or something. And it just snapped off. And, of course, he just keeps running after the kids in the dark. Well, there's a geyser of water. But nobody knew it. Nobody oh, noticed it or know. knew it oh. until someone came into our fire circle. And they were not part of our church group. They were not in our circle. They were, like, in the next sites over. But it was a lower elevation. And the water had finally flooded to the point that oh, it no. reached the tent they were sleeping in oh, on no. the ground. Oh, and they no. were sopping wet, and they were pretty mad. Oh, and, no. uh, of course, we were horrified when we discovered it. Our men, you know, improvised, and they, they're looking for the water shot off, couldn't find it. Big old campground, couldn't find it. And uh, one of them just took a, a wood stake and drove it into that pipe until it, you know, squelched the water. And, and uh, then they're looking for the manager. we got to find somebody. Where's the manager at? we got to fix this problem. Couldn't find the manager. Finally, after a lot of time went by, they found the manager. Well, the night manager was an 18-year-old kid. He comes in his car. When he hears the story, he says, well, I want to know who's responsible. He says, well, first of all, let's find the water. Says, no, we're not shutting this water off. Tell I know who's responsible. And I thought of this lesson. I thought, this guy needs our leadership lesson. <laughs> Don't fix the blame before you fix the problem. That's good. Fix the That's problem. Good. You know, a football, you know what, what they say about football. They say football is 22 guys on a field desperately in need of a rest, being watched by tens of thousands in the stands desperately in need of exercise. <laughs> That's what football is. <laughs> but in every football game, somebody is going to fumble the ball. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that team is trained from day one that when there's a fumble, you forget your assigned roles. Yeah. You just cover the fumble. You cover the mistake. It, uh, that, you, that may be the only time you touch a football the entire week. But it's everybody's responsibility to try to recover the fumble. Don't worry about who fumbled it or why. We'll fix that later in the locker room. We'll fix right. that later next week when we go in training or what have you, right? That's well, the good. same applies to leadership. Don't fix the blame for problems. Just fix the problem. And we'll figure out later how to avoid it the next time. Yeah. Two styles of leadership. Mm -hmm. The position leader knows how it's done. The influence leader shows how it is done. The position leader depends upon authority. I think I might have duplicated this one. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. Uh, the, position, the position leader says go. The influence leader says let's go. You may impress people from a distance, but you're going to influence them up close. Now, this is a, a real pictures of real events. Brother Haney, when he was our general superintendent, was preaching one night at general conference. Well, superintendent's night to preach. And he called me. I don't know if Brother Haney had ever called me before. How I even got a hold of him. I got my number. And he said, Bill Hodges, can I meet with you in the morning for breakfast? And so that next picture is Brother Haney and I. And he came down the leather jacket early, early in the morning. And we had breakfast. It was something he wanted to discuss and talk about. And I thought, wow, that's, that, I mean, that impressed me. You know, that impressed me more than seeing him up on the stage preaching at general conference. You can impress people from a distance. Anybody can. That's good. But you're that's really going to influence them by getting close to them. Yeah. Getting in their life. Becoming a friend. Having a relationship. True leadership success is measured by those closest to you. You see, what really matters is not what people 
say about you who know you only from a distance. What really matters is what my wife says about me and my kids, right. my grandkids, my family. That's what really matters. In fact, I've got a, a, a lesson that I teach in minister seminars and what have you. And, um, and the lesson is kind of the opposite of what we hear you know, all our lives. And the lesson is a question. What comes first? Ministry or family? Ministry or marriage? Ministry or family? And, uh, and of course I get the responses. And then I say, well, actually, what comes first is ministry. I explain. All right, let's, what's the most important thing in your life? The most important thing. It's your personal salvation. Right. That's more important than anything, right? Yeah. That we make heaven our home individually, forever. That's number one most important. All right. How did you get to the place where now you believe you are, quote unquote, saved when the Lord comes, you're going to go to heaven, not go to hell, by dying to self? Yeah. By laying yourself on the altar and saying, God, not my will, your will be done. From this day, you know, what's the scripture say? To die is gain, to live is Christ. Okay? So our gain is going to be when we're raptured out of here. That's our gain. Everything else is about Christ. The only reason we're still alive is about I was standing in a baptistry once, baptizing a person that just came in. We don't know anything about them. They might have been a drug, he might have been a whatever. Like, first time they ever been to church. They repented of their sins. We're baptizing him. He came up on the water speaking in tongues. And I said, God, I said, uh, why don't you just zap him right now? Let me step out of the water first. All right, <laughs> zapping God, if you're going to use electricity, you know. Because that's the only sure way we know he'll be in heaven. I mean, this may be his one and only time to come to church. He may walk out of here, and we may never see him again. I don't know anything about his life. I don't know what's... But right now, he's ready. He's ready, yeah. he's ready right that's now. Right. I said, God, you have a thousand percent batting record if you do that. And God kind of said to me, he said, you dummy. If I did that, there'd be nobody left on earth to tell others that's how to be saved. Oh, that's a good point, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, why did I get off on that rabbit trail? Ministry. Your ministry. Oh, thank you. So, your ministry. so, number one, your personal salvation. Yes. But you laid your life down and said, it's not for me, it's for Christ. And so, number two, then, is what you do for Christ. That's called ministry. But here's the kicker. That's really a false que question because mm -hmm. it's not an either or. It's not right. a do I choose this or it's do good. I choose that? Do I choose ministry or do I choose family? No. When you understand ministry, your first ministry is your to family. your marriage. That's right. That's right. Your first ministry is to your family. Yeah. Yeah. And everything beyond your house and ministry has got to be an outgrowth of that. Right. You've got to succeed in that before you do the other. Right. Paul even said, we've got to command our children, our household, now, when they're no longer in your household, you're not, they're adults, they're responsible. But as long as they're in your household, that's why God chose Abraham. Why God chose Abraham? Because he said, I know he'll command his children yes, and the generations after to says. walk in my yeah. ways. That's why God chose Abraham. That's why God blessed Abraham. Amen. So your first ministry is to your family. So ministry comes first to your marriage, to your family, and then from that to to the world. Amen. So true leadership is measured, true success in leadership is measured by those closest to you. Was Noah a success or a failure? And he preached, what, 100 plus years? And he only won eight souls? But nobody calls Noah a failure, do they? No, he did what God right. called him to do. He did all he could do. And right. at the end of the day, you know, one plants, another waters. God gives I can't increase. make it increase. God gives it the increase. Yeah. If I know I'm doing what I'm called to do, then, you know, the results are up to God ultimately. You can teach what you know, but you're going to reproduce what you are. Now, this picture, I love this picture. This is, an old, this is like a 13-year-old picture. But that's my oldest grandson. He's 15 now. And he was like two in that picture. And this was like a Christmas production. We had a stage built, all kinds of props and whatever. And after the production is all done, altars all done, everything's all done, people like fellowshipping, one of the saints came and said, hey, pastor, look at your grandson up there. On his own, he climbed up on the on the platform, climbed up on this, I think a stage was built on top of the platform, actually, and he climbed up on that, and he, there, that's my Bible, and he grabbed a microphone, and he got in the mic, and he started pre he couldn't even really, he just, you couldn't understand what he was saying, just, rah, 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 and he would turn a page in the Bible, and, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> he was preaching for the first time. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, that's cute. We took pictures. It's funny. But it really illustrates a principle here. Yeah. That you're going to reproduce that's right. that's what right. you are. Yeah. That's it. People are going to become like you. You know, one truism for leaders, and I use this a lot. Every day, you've got to make this choice. Today, am I going to be someone's example? Or am I going to be someone's excuse? That's a choice you're going to make every single day. Am I going to be someone's example? Or am I going to be someone's excuse? I've told my children, you know what? We can't afford to be anybody's excuse. The Bible calls that being a stumbling block and hindering, hindering the children of God. We've got to be examples. We gotta live better than we really are. We gotta be better than we really are. We gotta act better than we are all the time. Because we've died. <laughs> it must be Christ that's living now in us. We've got to be examples. What did Paul say? Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow Christ. Right. Got to be that example. Now, leadership is both something you are and something you do. There's no success without a successor. There's another picture. Again, that one's like. 13 years old, too. The same little guy down there. This was actually at my wife's father's church, my father-in-law's church. He pastored a church in Athens, Texas, Spanish language church. In fact, he was the Texas District Spanish superintendent for 20 years or something like that. Um, and, and we were preaching in his church. Now we're praying in the altar. And on his own, this little guy slipped up, and he saw me praying with him, and he just put his hand out on this young guy and started praying with him. Successor. There's no success without a... Successor. Every one of us, it's up to God, of course, to choose successors, but we should be doing all we can to mentor and prepare people. They might not succeed you, but they might succeed in some other place right. or individuals, That's but right. because you have equipped and prepared them for that. That's right. So we always should be replicating and duplicating as much as, as is good in us in other people. That's part of our ministry as a leader. So leadership is both something you are and something you do. Emerson said, what lies behind you and what lies before you pales when compared to what lies within you. What lies behind you, what lies before you pales when compared to what lies within you. Edwin Markham said, we are blind until we see that in the human plan, nothing is worth the making if it does not make the man. Why build these cities glorious if man unbuilded goes? In vain we build the world unless the builder also grows. I love that. I love that poetic expression of the importance of personal growth. <laughs> Jack Parr said, looking back on my life, it's my, looking back, my life seems to be one long obstacle course with me as the chief obstacle. <laughs> and we were like, to that, yes. Yes. that's honestly true for all of us. Amen. Yes. I think Brother, Brother Billy Cole said it right. He said, your biggest enemy is not the devil. That's your right. biggest enemy is you. you. He said, I can cast any devil in the world out of any single human person, but I can't cast you out of your own flesh. That's so right. so, so we're, we're the biggest enemy we have to ourselves. Yes. Just yes. the guy looking back in the mirror at us. That's, that's our biggest challenge right there, for sure. Zig Ziglar, he was my, one of my favorites. I cut my teeth on him. My dad had all his tapes, went to his seminars. And I grew up, I got to meet Zig Ziglar on a few occasions. And he, he's awesome. In fact, they're still playing some of his stuff. He, he's been dead now a few years, several years. But here's what he said. He said, you got to be before you can do. Mm -hmm. And you got to do before you can have. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's not true literally in the American way of life. Yeah. Because the American way of life is you can have all you want. There used to be a beer commercial. Remember this one? It said, you only go around once in life, so grab for all the gusto you can. I remember that? I remember that when I was a teenager. And, uh, and that's really the philosophy of the American way, right? You can have anything you want right now. It's basically play now, pay later. Yeah, yeah, right. And unfortunately, America is so prosperous that you really can play now and pay later. But here's also a truth. You can do that, but if you do, the price is always greater than if you pay now and play later. And that's God's way. And that's what Ziggler is saying. Vince Lombardi, the famed coach of the, at that time, champion Green Bay Packers. No team so dominant as they were in their time. But here's what he said. He said, the way you win shows a lot of your character. The way you lose shows all of your character. <laughs> so true. Shows all 
of your character. Sometimes God, I believe, just allows us to have some losses so it can bring some things out That's that true. maybe we've not been dealing with, had to deal with, and God's just trying to purify it up, purify us in the heat of the furnace of trials, like he did for me this evening, trying to get these computer files to work out. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for my wife. I can pray when I don't feel like praying. John Maxwell said this. He was my neighboring pastor for several years. He said everything, I mean everything, rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Again, grow people to grow a church. Rick Warren said, if you want to know the temperature of your organization, put a thermometer in the leader's mouth. <laughs> and that's how you know the temperature of your organization. So one time when I was church growth coordinator, I was uh, at headquarters at a meeting. This is my young days in pastorate. And one of our top leaders, in fact, I think it was actually Brother Urshan, we were going to lunch, and he said, Brother Hodges, you're the church growth coordinator for UPCI. What's the number one most important thing that we need to know about church growth? And without even thinking, it just kind of like popped out. And after I said it, I thought, you know, that's actually pretty good. I think that's probably right. You know? <laughs> so I put it on the slide, back, so here you go. I'm giving the credit to the Lord because I didn't really pre this or anything. But I said, the most important aspect of church growth is the attitude of the leadership. That's true. The attitude that's of leadership. True. And the next lesson, Lord willing, I'm going to deal just with that topic right there. The attitude of a leadership. I love this. The CEO of Hyatt Hotels said this. If there's anything I've learned in my 27 years in the service industry, it is this. 99% of all employees want to do a good job. How they perform is simply a reflection yep. of the one for whom they work. Mm. Wow, that really hit me. I mean, who are we working for? Right. We're working for the King of Kings, right? right? We're working for the Lord of Lords. Amen. Yes. I can't slough yes. off on this job. This is the highest right. calling on planet Earth. Yes. And how I perform is a reflection yes. of the one and on the one for whom That's good. I yeah. am working. Amen. Yes. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do it heartily yeah. as unto the Lord and not unto men. Leaders produce leaders. Now I'm gonna give you a five step leadership development process. In fact, this model fits almost anything that we're using here for leaders produce leaders. And by the way, you cannot skip steps. I've learned that. We all want to skip steps, you'll see why in a minute, but you cannot skip steps, you just can't. Number one, I model, that means I do it. We all start there. It all starts there. I do it. Now, if you're a church planner, you really know what that means. You do it all. I mean, you know, you're the janitor. You're the greeter. You're the uh, accountant, the bill payer. Um, you're everything. I mean, you, you literally just do it all. I grew up in a church planner's home. My dad planted churches in Arizona, Florida, California. And until I was at the age of probably, I'm going to say probably 10 um, my bedrooms were Sunday school rooms. So I, I, my, I had a bunk bed in my room, and I slept on the top bunk, and the evangelist slept on the bottom. Okay. So that's, that's just the way that it was, right? You just do it all. You just do it. So that's step number one. I model. I do it. Step number two. Now, there's five steps. The hardest step is going from step one to step two, actually. Going from I model to I mentor. Why? Well, because when I mentor, it means I do it, but now you are with me. And what does that mean? It slows you down. Yeah. You master something. You know how to do it. You can do it almost without, without effort. Are we, are we off on our handouts here or something? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you know what? Oh, you know what? Um, okay, you know what? Probably what I did. I know what happened. I probably got the wrong uh, PowerPoint file with this. Um, and so it's going to be in another lesson. But since we're on it, go ahead and find it. It's, it's probably lesson. Principles 103. Either lesson it's, uh, third from the three or four. Uh, I forget. Four or five pages back on the back. Sorry about that. That's all right. That's what happens yeah. if I just do one lesson. Yeah. Sometimes right. whole thing, some other uh, lessons. Four pages. Back. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. We're on it. We'll just do it, and when we get to that lesson, we'll, we'll just do review. Thanks for catching that. Okay. 
It's all right. Uh, so number two, I mentor. I do it. You're with me. Th this is the hardest step of all to take because once you master something, you can do it quickly, easily, you can almost do it without thinking. So but if you've got somebody there beside you, what are they doing? Asking questions. Yeah. They are just pestering you with questions. But that's a necessary step. In fact, here's how committed you got to be to this. Here's how committed I was to this. When I, when I realized this and said, okay, I'm going to focus on growing people, not growing a church. We have a Christian school. And I said, you know what? I'm not making a hospital call without taking somebody with me. Sometimes I would stop by the Christian school if I'm out, headed out on a mercy call. And I would say, um, is there any students that are done with their work today? And I'd take one of those students with me just to fulfill this. I'm not going to do personal ministry alone. That's right? so good. Yeah. Mentor. Good. In fact, uh, yeah, let me, let me go one step further here. Um, Brother Price, Paul Price, was our district superintendent of Western District for 34 years. And during this era, he asked me one year to travel with him and his, his team to every section in our district when they did section conferences. And he said, we've never done this, we want to do this. I want you to do a leadership training in every section, one session when they come for district conference for their, I mean, uh, section conference for their voting or whatever. So I said, okay. So I sat down with him. I said, well, what, what are you wanting? I mean, I got so much, but we'll, we'll design something just for this. And so I tried to elicit from him, like, what he felt like the real needs were. So I put together a lesson for that. Well, there's 13 sections oh, in the Western District. Right? There were. Well, I think they're back up to 13 again. Uh, 13 sections in the Western District. It, you were there. It takes a long time. I mean, you know, after that one time traveling, I said, hats off to Brother Price and Brother Cantrell and the four leaders that have to do this every single year, two and a half weeks. It's, yeah. it's crazy. And, uh, but I did it that one, that one year. So the second week, I decided it, it must have hit around Easter time or something because the second week, my son was going to be out of school. He was probably 10 at the time. He was in Bible quizzing. He was, a, he was I think, two or three years running the high score Bible quizzing in the nation as a junior. Yeah. People thought he had a, well, I think he did. It does have a photographic nice. memory. And, and it was amazing. So I thought, well, I'm going to take my son and uh, just, you know, father-son time. And so about the third night, we're, and you're in a different city every night, different hotel. We're getting ready, and he says, Dad, he says, do I have to go tonight? I said, well, yeah, what, what's the alternative? I mean, well, I'll just stay in the room. I said, I can't leave a 10-year-old right. in a <laughs> hotel room in a strange city by, by, by himself. Why, why would you even ask that question? He said, well, are you going to teach the same thing tonight you've been teaching all the other nights? <laughs> I said, well, well yes. He said, I'm sick of hearing it, Dad. <laughs> and every preacher needs a son. I'm telling you, every preacher needs a son. And I said, you know what? If they surprise you, I'm sick of hearing myself. He said, well, change it up then. I said, well, I can't. You've got to understand, I'm doing this at the behest of my, my authority, my district superintendent. And even though it's old hat to us, the audience is new and fresh every night. It's new to them. Kind of like being a missionary. I feel sorry for those <laughs> missionary kids after yes. hearing that, especially in the old days when they deputized for sometimes I think over two years, you know. Right. Uh, can only imagine. Uh, so I said, tell you what, son. I said, you go with, he, oh, oh, here's what else he said. He said, I know what you are going to say even before you say it. <laughs> I said, yeah, you, you, you probably do. And uh, I said, tell you what, I'll make you a deal. <clears throat> we'll go. Why don't you? Do the speaking tonight. I'll set up. I was using PowerPoint like this, so we'll set up the screen on that. You do the speaking, and I'll give you the offering. He said, "They gave an offering." I said, "Yeah." He said, "How much?" I said, "Well, I don't know actually. They're going to give me something in the end, but I said it's probably at least a hundred bucks a night." He said, "Really? You get a hundred dollars every night?" I said, "I probably will." He said, "You would give me that hundred dollars?" I said, "I sure will." He said, "Okay, I'm going. Let's do it." <laughs> anyway, here we go. So we. We get to the meeting, we get there a little early, we're setting up our, those days we had to carry our own projectors, you know, we're setting up a little projector, getting things ready. You know how it is, the people start filtering in, and as they do, start talking in groups of threes, and pretty soon you got a little group around you, and, and when the crowd's really starting to come in, I feel this tug on my coat, and it's my son, I know it, I just ignore it. It gets more and more, uh, more and more emphatic, and finally I said, what? He said, dad, 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 I said, you know what we talked about earlier, he says, we were just joking about that, right? Right? <laughs> Reality started. started now, I didn't take him with me to the lecture, but that's the whole point. If you'll just have someone with you, 
you know, more lessons are caught than are taught. That's right. Know? That's right. Really. You, you learn more by osmosis than you do by diligent study. Now, we shouldn't not study. We've got to do that. But I'm just saying that there's value just not doing ministry alone. Having somebody yes. with you. Right. Number three. Number three. I'm on there. That means you do it, and now I'm with you. I love this story. It's, 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 it's an old story, but it's still, I, I love it every time I hear it. Come and tell it. Uh, it's supposed to be a true story. This fellow that was on the Toastmaster speaker circuit, he was a doctor, medical doctor. And he became very popular, very successful. And he had a limousine, and he had a driver. And he was going to speak in a brand new city he had never spoken at before. And uh, so on the way, his chauffeur, he says, hey, doc, which speech are you doing tonight? And the doctor told him, he said, that's my favorite speech. He said, I've memorized that speech. The doctor said, really? He said, yeah. He said, let me hear you. And, and the chauffeur, as they're driving out, he just launches into that speech. The doctor was amazed. He really did. He had it on pat. Not only had he memorized all the words, he had every voice inflection, every hand gesture, every facial expression. I mean, he had it down to a T. And, and the, uh, the doctor says, you want to have fun tonight? He says, well, what? He says, why don't we switch places? Nobody there knows me by sight, only by name and reputation. Why don't we switch places and have a little fun? He said, you mean it? Yeah, let's do it. They pulled over, traded places. He put on the chauffeur's hat, chauffeur's coat. They switched roles. They pull up in front of City Hall, big, you know, where people are going to gather, and, and uh, people come out, and, and the, chauffeur, the doctor in chauffeur's clothes gets out, opens the door for the chauffeur in the doctor's seat, and, and, and he just gets ushered right in. Oh, Dr. So-and-so, we're glad to have you here. And the doctor goes and parks the car, goes sits on the back row. Finally, they introduce the famous Dr. So-and-so. The chauffeur gets up there, and he launches into it. Nobody has a clue. But something happened that never had happened before. Someone stood up and interrupted his speech with a question. And it was a very difficult technical question. And just a silence hit that audience. And the chauffeur at the mic, he said, you know, in all my years of giving these speeches, he said, never one time has anybody ever interrupted me with a question until tonight. And he said, to think it would be a man of your upstanding and influence in this community, I can't believe you would interrupt my speech with a question that is so elementary, so simple, my chauffeur sitting on the back row can answer that question right now. That's good stuff. Well, that's really what I monitor it is. It's you do it, but I'm there. I'm there to pick up the fumble that's if you good. if you stumble, okay? Awesome. And uh, so that that's a necessary step. Now that's when it starts getting easier. Here's where it really gets easier for you. I motivate you. You do it. I don't have to be there. Now, you're not doing this just to be easy. You're doing this to be more effective. Right. Because if now you're doing it, I don't have to be there. I can be doing it here. We can be doubling yeah. our efforts and our results. That's right. And then finally, it doesn't complete itself until step number five, which is I multiply. This is now you are doing it and somebody's with you. Yeah. Now, you're back up on step number two right there. Right. Now, this cycle can be applied to about any arena of leadership production. For example... We like to tell people teaching home Bible study, you've not successfully completed this teaching of home Bible study just when you get someone born again. Thank God when that happens. When they repent, they're baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of their sins, they receive the Holy Ghost. Thank God for that. But you know what? That's not the end of that Bible study. They need now to go with you teaching the next Bible study and the next and next until they feel comfortable. Hey, I think maybe I can do a lesson. Yeah. And you're right there yeah. to monitor them. You're right there That's to help right. them. Until finally they say, you know what, I, I got so-and-so, I think I could do this on my own. And, and they do it. And then they say, you know, I'm doing it and now I've got somebody else with me. That completes that yeah, reproduction cycle of mm -hmm. producing leaders and fruit in the kingdom of God. No leadership success without a success. I'm going to close with these three illustrations. Bruce Larson writes a book called Both Wind and Fire. And he's writing about interesting facts about Sandhill Cranes. Now, I'm going to give you three of those facts. Oh, okay. is, is this another one too where I... No, we're going jump? back we're to back. Back. Sorry about that. Oh, you're good. back it's on the Okay, here we go. Now we're back on the track. Right. Okay. So here we go. <clears throat> Here's what he said. He said, these large birds who fly great distances across continents have three remarkable qualities. Number one, first, they rotate leadership. 
No one bird stays out in front all the time. There's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one simple, obvious reason is so he doesn't wear himself out. So they share leadership. Another reason, so others get the opportunity. Others can learn and so on. Number two, they choose leaders who can handle turbulence. That's really good. If you're going to be a leader, you are going to encounter problems. Right. You just mark it down. Now, this is the honest to God truth. I don't know why it happened, but maybe just so I could use this illustration. I don't know. For the first five years of our pastor, of, as being senior pastor, I can't recall losing a single person. We had phenomenal, exponential growth. So much so, I thought, wow, this is amazing. I don't know what I'm doing right, but something's really right because this is amazing. <clears throat> Five years of phenomenal, no hardly any problem, didn't lose a single family or so. It was amazing. Just add, increase, add, increase, no attrition. It was amazing. Well, then reality set in, and we hit turbulence. And we hit one of the most, even today, I would say one of the most serious traumas of our life in ministry. So serious and difficult. My wife and we were living on the church property at the time. We bought a church. We went all in. Sold the only house we had and put everything in the church we could just to make it happen. We went from a $500 a month mortgage. This is, talk, we're talking 1988, something like that. Around 1988, right, 1990. Went from a $500 a month mortgage overnight to a $5,000 a month mortgage. And the $500 a month mortgage, I don't remember a month we did, we made it without having to take a special license. So that's that's how that's how a leap of faith we're taking. And just when we got into that, we had this huge traumatic thing happen. You talk about turbulence, this was like hurricane. This was like tornado. This was like Hang on for your life. Mm. And we would lay, we're living at the church. And we would lay, we're going to do that for two years. That was a game plan. It ended up being six years. But we're laying, laying in bed, living in a house there at the church. And we're, we're crying at night. And, and I'm contemplating, God, you know, if this is me, just, I'll just tell me. I'll just step out. I'll step back. I'll give this to somebody else. I don't want to hurt your kingdom. I don't want to hurt your church. I don't want to hurt your name, your reputation, your whatever, you know. Very, very traumatic, traumatic time in our in our life. And and I, I still would choose to go through that if I had the choice. I didn't have the choice, but I wouldn't choose to go through it. But I know all things work together for the good, and God used that, certainly used that to uh, help us and strengthen us. We recently had a, in 2020, most people remember it as the year of COVID. I remember this year of court because we literally had 11 federal court level ruling decisions in less than one year, including three at the U.S. Supreme Court. And I had people say, well, how do you do that? It must be so much pressure. Honestly, that was a piece of cake to what we went through 35 years ago. Wow. So if nothing else, God was using that situation, no doubt, to prepare us for this and other things. But uh, the Lord knows. But the point being is, you will experience turbulence. Yes. That is just part of being a leader. You will experience and finally, number three, all during the time one bird is leading, the rest are honking their affirmation. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I guess now help in several pastoral transitions, and uh, one here in Tennessee, years ago actually, came out twice, you know, eight years before. Um, and uh, I just dealt with one just this, this uh, actually this week, <laughs> early this week, before we flew out here. And, um, and, and I kind of put in the finishing touches on something, and I gave them a piece of advice. I actually got it from the experience in Tennessee. And uh, it's an elder pastor retiring, younger pastor going to be coming in, coming on, and taking the senior pastor role. And the elder pastor is not leaving. He's not, he's not, he's going to stay there. And I said, and, and to find me, we spent two days, two days together. This, this week, Monday, Tuesday, spent two days together in Los Angeles. And the very last thing they asked after two days of working through everything, they said, what's your final word of advice for us? And I said, my final word of advice, and I already addressed this earlier in the meetings, but I said, my final word of advice is 
this will work if each one of you commit to being the other's greatest fan. Mm -hmm. You'll overcome anything and everything. That's right. But only if you each are committed right. to being the other's greatest fan. Mm -hmm. If you are, then it will work. If you aren't, it may or may not. And that's the principle right here from this book. Honk your approval. Whoever's in leadership, help them in leadership. That's good, yeah. I mean, it's kind of the golden rule, isn't it? Doing yeah. to others is sure. you have to do it to you. I mean, that's really the basic of Jesus and all the law and the prophets kind of thrown this right here, you know. Um, loving your neighbors yourself, golden rule of that thing. So become one another's greatest fan club. Whatever your leadership role and position is in the church, be the greatest fan and supporter of the pastor. Yeah. And if you're the pastor, be the greatest fan and supporter of the leaders yeah. in the church. Yeah. Be each other's greatest fan club. Be each other's greatest cheerleader. Yeah. Greatest cheerleader. And it can and will work. So God bless you. That's lesson number one. Thank you, Jesus. All right.